So the big problem or thing that we want to cover today is we have some sort of small embedded device. These are starting to be everywhere. They're super cheap. And we want to send data to it or get data from it with a phone. So we want to connect these two together. We want to make it easy as possible to do. So one way we can do this is Bluetooth, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And I think Bluetooth uh, works well for a lot of reasons. It's not without its challenges, and it doesn't solve everything. But it does a lot of these things well in connecting phones with other devices. So some of the alternatives, Wi-Fi or just networking in general is a great alternative. Phones are really good at this. They're almost always connected to a network. You can get anywhere. Embedded devices, on the other hand, um, there's not always a Wi-Fi access point. <clears throat> They can have cellular radios. Problem is these devices have not a lot of processing power and not a lot of memory. So if you add a whole TCP stack and HTTP and stuff on there, you can then be left with barely any memory to write code. It also uses a lot of power. It also requires configuration. So for some projects that works well. Uh, Bluetooth can do a lot of it without the configuration with lower power, things like that. When I'm doing uh, Arduino-based projects and stuff like that, uh, other technologies we use, XB and ZigBee, Z-Wave, 433 megahertz, and other 2.4 gigahertz technologies. Those are all great when you want to make mesh networks and connect a whole bunch of embedded devices. Problem is, almost no phones have those. I think there was a Samsung phone that had Z-Wave, but for the most part, those aren't going to be available to us unless we built a gateway and then had that gateway go to IP and then went over the network. <coughs> So I'm going to give a little background on Arduino first. <coughs> Excuse me. So Arduinos are small uh, microcontrollers. They're made for uh, education. They use really cheap processors. The board itself is about $25. The processor is about three bucks. Um, probably even cheaper if you're buying more. And they're really good at doing input and output. So you can connect to physical devices. You can control things, and you can read information back. So we're going to use some Bluetooth with that today. So usually when you want to do Bluetooth, you want to get one of these uh, breakout boards, like on the left, which is just a little board with some pins and it does Bluetooth. Or, uh, I'm sorry, right. On the left is a what's called a shield. And a shield is just a special type of board that's pin compatible with Arduino when it plugs in top. So it makes it easy to program. And so you see some people, they'll stack a bunch of shields up. We're going to be using the breakout boards today for a number of reasons. But they all effectively have, behave pretty similar. Wow, and if we had the, oh, here we go, maybe, waiting for my slow network. <clears throat> there we go. So we're going to have an Arduino, and we're going to have one of these Bluetooth radios. And we're going to hook them together with some wires. And it's basically just a serial connection between them. One transmits, the other receives, the other transmits, and it receives. They're wired together, and they're just talking serial. It's basically stuffing data in a pipe, reading data out of a pipe. Now I'm showing arrows there. In actuality, we're going to have some wires connecting those two together. But the nice thing about that is it makes it really simple. When we're programming our Arduino code, we use something called software serial, which emulates a serial port on any of those two pins. And we can basically just say, write data to it. We can say, is data available? Read data from it. And then, once we get the Arduino with the Bluetooth, we'll have the phone. And that little breakout board will handle all the Bluetooth going between the Arduino and the phone. And a lot of that happens seamlessly to us. Um, when we're using Android, we're going to pair our device with that Bluetooth board. When we're using iOS, we're using Bluetooth Low Energy, so we won't even have to pair. So the first thing we need to do is we need to program the Arduino. When you're programming the Arduino, you use something called the Arduino IDE. It's a Java-based app. Um, it runs across all platforms. And when we're programming it, we're writing it in a subset of C. And originally, I avoided Arduino for a long time because I'm like, I write too much C doing other stuff. I don't want to do this. Fortunately, it's a um, user-friendly kind of C. They try to really, in the user programs, avoid pointers and avoid all those other things that are just a real pain. And you, when you're running a library, you hide all that in your library. So you use this Arduino ID. You load in what's called a sketch. And you plug the board in via USB. So the board's plugged in. And then you hit play on there, and it, it compiles and uploads the program. There's no operating system on the Arduino. So once this code is uploaded, it's just running all the time. So we'll look at some of the pieces here. So the first bit we need to do is we're using software serial. That's how we're going to connect to our Bluetooth radio. So we import a library. And everything, when we're doing I.O., we do pins. So I'm defining the receive pin, 
is six and the transmit pin is seven. So if you look at the Arduino board, all the, uh, all the pins along there have numbers on them. And then we call software serial, we create a Bluetooth object with those pins. Now receive and transmit are from the um, Arduino's perspective. Um, it's always receive on one to transmit on the other, transmit to receive. And then we're going to have a counter variable. This is just a variable there that we're going to increment. We're going to have a really, really simple uh, thing to start here. So when you're programming Arduino, there's kind of two main methods. There's a setup, which gets called once. It's kind of like a constructor. So in the setup, we set up serial. Serial, in this case, is our debugging console. So if you're thinking JavaScript, it's like console.log. And then we set up Bluetooth. And so begin is kind of the convention on a lot of these libraries. It just bootstraps them and gets them going. And then I'm going to do serial print Bluetooth counter so we get to see that from the uh, debug console. And then the loop method. The loop method gets called over and over again forever, all the time. And so in here, we're going to print the uh, counter value to serial. We'll print it to Bluetooth. We'll increment it. We'll sleep for 1,000 milliseconds. And we'll do that again. So what this, this Arduino is sitting here, it's got a Bluetooth radio on it. And it's just going to count, starting at zero and count up, um, which isn't very exciting in itself, but it provides a good set of changing data, and it shows how we can have the phone read values from an Arduino. <clears throat> so if I switch to the Arduino IDE, and this sketch has been uploading. Hang on, we got to plug in the other port. Whenever you connect the serial monitor, uh, on this particular Arduino, it restarts the program. So we see there we get Bluetooth counter, and it just starts counting. So we're going to leave that there. So now that we have the Arduino portion working, we need to get some code on the phone. Now we could write native iOS, or I'm sorry, we could write native Android code to connect and read from there. There's a lot of different pieces involved. Um, so one of the things I did is once I wrote some native Android code, I'm like, wow, this could be a really good plugin. So I wrote the Bluetooth serial plugin. Really, when I was writing this, I tried to uh, mirror it after how simple the Arduino library was and just keep it you know, just enough functionality you needed. So if you have a Cordova project, and you know, I use the Cordova CLI for everything, you can install the plugin with uh, plugin install. If you're not using CLI, you can use Plugman and install it. The plugin is in the repo, so if you look at uh, cordova.plugins.io, you can see the plugin there. So once it's installed, we need to get our phone to connect to the Bluetooth radio. So in your app, uh, usually you wait for device ready to be fired by PhoneGap. And PhoneGap, or I'm going to use PhoneGap and Cordova interchangeably. I should be using Cordova, but I use PhoneGap out of habit. So in, <clears throat> in your Cordova program, I usually have an index.js file, which is my main program. And I wait for uh, the Cordova framework to fire the JavaScript device ready function. Once that function's fired, I know I can call APIs and do things. Normally that happens very, very fast. So inside of that, I'm going to want to connect to this radio. So I know the MAC address. It has a hardware address, just like a network card. And then I use Bluetooth serial connect, and I pass in a MAC address and then two functions. One function that gets called when I'm connected, and one function that gets called when I'm disconnected. Um, so this works very similar to almost any Cordova APIs that you see. If we want to send data, oh, and the Bluetooth serial, as the plugin gets installed, it creates a global variable called Bluetooth serial. So that's just available there. If the name is too long you don't like, you can alias it to something else. So if we want to send data over Bluetooth to the Arduino, once I'm connected, we can just call write. We write a string and it shows up on the other side. Very cool. If we want to receive data, it's a little bit different. So if you want to treat this kind of like a regular serial connection or stream, you could say Bluetooth serial available. It'll tell you, are bytes available, are bytes not available? And then you can read bytes if you want to do that. And that works really well in a language like Java or something like that. But in Cordova, since we need to do callbacks for everything, the code was getting really clunky to do that, because it was like, ask something, have a callback, and it was like the triangle of doom. And I was like, wait a minute, this is really kind of an event-based thing. So there's a subscribe method. And as long as the data coming back from Bluetooth is tokenizable or you can break it up in chunks, in this case, I'm breaking it up with a slash n or a line feed there. Um, what I can do is anytime that the underlying plugin sees that line feed, 
it'll call my callback method on message, and I can do anything I want with that data. So in this case where we're counting, there's a line feed between every one of those numbers. So the message comes in, and since I've subscribed to a line feed, it'll call on message, and I can do something like log that to the console. Once again, nice and straightforward. <clears throat> So if we look at this project here, there's very few files in there. I have an index file that has my, it basically has a div. Crap, I didn't make my font bigger, hang on. All right, so we have a div where we have the counter variable. We just start that out with an ellipsis. And then I have another div for a status message. So as data is coming in, I'm just going to manipulate the inner HTML on those. And then in my index JavaScript, I have my MAC address up top saying, hey, this is a MAC address I want to connect to. I have some standard uh, boilerplate stuff that comes. I have this app variable where I have my whole app in there. So we have an initialize, a bind object. So on device ready, that's where we're doing the connect. We say, hey, let's connect to this MAC address. And there's an app on connect. So when we connect, it calls this other function where I subscribe, and I set the app on message. We get an alert, uh, we get an alert if we disconnect. But on message, we just set the uh, inner HTML to the value that we get. So now, this is a live demo, so these are always fun. If all goes well, I'll be able to show you this on my phone. So I have this little program. It's not quite as fancy as the one Steve was using that mirrors my phone's display here. And uh, I could compile this and run it, but I'm not really that brave. So we'll launch the app. And then it connects. And it says the MAC address down there that they connected to. And then it starts receiving values. So this uh, last time when I connected the serial monitor, it was one of these here. So it's counting there, sending data and counting and sending data here. If we reset the Arduino, there's a little bit of a lag here on the, uh, so if we reset the Arduino, the Arduino processor restarts that program and connects, but since the Bluetooth radio had power, we are able to keep that Bluetooth connection and then start receiving data again. Um, so once again, not a very useful example for doing stuff, but it's, I think it illustrates how simple it is to send data back and forth or send data from the Arduino to the phone. <clears throat> so now, the one problem with that was that I had to hard code the MAC address, which works great if I'm writing something for my house and I want to connect and do something. But if I want to give you guys an app, that doesn't work very well. So there's this function called list, um, which will list devices. So it takes a success and a failure callback. When you call list uh, with the success, success callback, it will give a list of any of the devices that are paired when you're on Android. And it gives some metadata. Most of the things you really care about are the name and the address. The address is the MAC address. The name is the friendly display name when I've paired my device. As an aside, if you try to connect to a MAC address without having it paired, on, on certain Android phones, it'll actually send a pairing request and through the operating system try to set you up with pairing and all that. But I haven't got that to consistently work across all devices, and especially older devices. So I always recommend pair your device before you start this. So you will notice in there, too, ID and address are the same thing. Uh, this plugin started off as Android only, and I was using address, which uses MAC address. When we get to iOS, iOS uses UUIDs. So ID is the kind of common one. It can either be an I, um, UUID or a MAC address. In this case, it's just a MAC address. Which brings me to what about iOS? So theoretically, iOS should be able to do the same thing. You have a Bluetooth radio, tons of people with these devices. The only problem is um, the, our, the Android one is using Bluetooth Classic and something called Serial Port Profile. And what Serial Port Profile is, is it's the Bluetooth Special Interest Group came up with this and they said, 
hey, if you want to do serial communications and you basically want to replace a wire from two things, you can use this, and here's how it works. Um, I think that an iOS phone will actually do that. The problem is, as a developer, I don't have access to that. You have to join a special Apple program and do all this stuff, so I'm not going to do that. But iOS does have Bluetooth low energy, so that's cool. So if you, as long as you have an iPhone 4S or newer, and I think maybe even the iPad 2 or newer, you get uh, Bluetooth low energy. So Bluetooth low energy is a little bit different, and we'll talk about some of the differences. Um, but as far as this plugin goes, since I had the plugin working for Android, I wanted to do serial communication, I try to have Bluetooth low energy mimic um, Bluetooth Classic as much as I can with this particular plugin. It's not a good solution for everything, but for doing these kind of, this kind of communication, it works great. So Bluetooth low energy is also referred to as Bluetooth smart, you may hear. There's a lot of marketing terms around this. Um, I'm going to use Bluetooth low energy. So as I mentioned before, although Bluetooth Low Energy doesn't have serial port profile or SPP, it does have serial, or a lot of the hardware I use has serial-like interfaces on there. So with Bluetooth Low Energy, a device advertises and provides services. And those services can be anything from, uh, there's some official ones like heart rate monitors and a lot of those are escaping me now. But anyway, there isn't, for some unknown reason, there isn't a serial port profile official spec. So what happens is a lot of the hardware manufacturers will come up with something that's serial-like. So that's what we're going to use today. So the serial-like or UART services from the um, Bluetooth radios perspective are going to have two characteristics. Um, everything in Bluetooth Low Energy is, is basically uses a big attribute database where you have an attribute name, an attribute value, and a lot of properties on it. So for the receive characteristic, there's going to be a writable property and we can write without response. And I just put that in there because it's technically correct, you don't have to worry about it. Basically, there's a value that we can write to from the phone. When we want to send data back, there's a, va there's a characteristic that's readable and it's notifiable. Readable means I can say to the device, hey, what's the value of that? Notify means that if that changes, it will tell me that it changed and I don't have to poll, which is very nice. So as, as data changes in the characteristic on the Arduino, it will notify the phone and just let the phone know, hey, there's new data to be read. Read it. Actually, that's not technically correct. It lets the, data, lets the phone know that there's new data and tells it what that data is. So here's one of the areas where the um, plugin has the same API signature, but the functionality is a little bit different. So if you're using iOS, Bluetooth serial list will go out and discover devices. Bluetooth low energy devices uh, advertise their presence. Kind of like when a Bluetooth classic device, you push a button and it advertises so you can connect. But most Bluetooth devices are always advertising. Hey, I'm here. This is my UUID. These are the services I provide. This is my name, stuff like that. So there's no pairing. When you're going out, you can discover any Bluetooth devices. Um, what this does on this plugin, there's two services I support. I support the um, the Red Bear Labs UART interface, and I support the uh, Nordic Semiconductor UART interface. So I basically limit it to say, go out and discover any devices that um, support those two functions. As I add more hardware, it'll automatically find those too. So similar to before, we get another list, so I can once again display this to the user, where I get a name, I get a UUID, and an ID. And so the UUID and the ID uh, can be used wherever a MAC address was used before. There is one other thing where I get RSSI, or the signal strength, coming back. And the thing you can use the signal strength for is you can try to guess how far away devices are from you. Um, so this is the signal strength as it's being advertised. Not all devices will give it to you. Not all devices will give it to you consistently. Um, but I put it in there so you can try to get it. Hopefully that will be an area that will be expanded in the future. And then so once you pick one of those devices you connect, there's no difference than uh, using Android. Mostly. The big caveat is that Bluetooth low energy, when it's sending characteristic data back and forth, the default is 20 bytes at a time, which is really small. Um, some radios will handle more, and there's support for blobs and stuff. I'm still working on figuring all that out. But really what that means is that if you want to send bigger data, you need to chunk that up. Um, and if you're reading it in in chunks, you need to chunk that up also. So there's, uh, with the Bluetooth Low Energy, there's definitely there's limited hardware support. I have links on the, if you go to the GitHub project, there's links to all that, kind of talks about it. 
Um, as people bring new hardware out, and if I can get people to send me hardware, I add more hardware support. So I'm going to do another demo. The last demo, we had the uh, Arduino talking to the phone and getting data. This, we're going to have the phone talk to the Arduino. In order to do this, I have a strip of LED colored lights here. And I want to make a UI on the phone where I can control the color of those lights and do it via Bluetooth so I can stand over here and do it. So since we're doing serial, I'm just kind of sending streams of data back and forth. And I need to make up kind of an API for this or a protocol. So my protocol is going to be I'm going to pass the letter C, and I'm going to pass three numbers for the red, green, and blue components of the color. So if I want to turn the lights blue, I'll send C00255 and then a line feed there across the wire. So it's nice and simple but it'll allow me to set these to any color that I want. OK, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, show a demo of this. And then once I show the demo, I'll kind of explain the pieces and how all that worked. So uh, give me just one second here. And OK, if this works, I should be able to use something called Reflector, where you get to see the phone's UI. There we go. And then sometimes, especially during demos, it doesn't like to connect. So we're going to refresh the list. This will work, I hope. <laughs> Let me just uh, restart this radio here. Sorry, this is all beta. There we go. All right. So this UI, and I'm not a UI guy, as you can probably tell by this, has three sliders. The slider is set from the top to bottom, red, green, and blue components of the color. There is the number 000, which is the current color I want to display. And there is the, uh, a preview of the color. So if I want to make it blue, I can do my blue slider and make that blue, or green, or red. So it's quite fun. And uh, you, know, you can amuse kids for hours with that. So I'll pass that around. If you guys want to mess with that, you can try that and uh, make pretty colors while we're doing this here. The, um, it'll be interesting. So Bluetooth has a range of uh, 10 meters for most Bluetooth. Um, so we'll see if we can get there. You may get too far and it'll break. It may not. So how do we do this here? So each of those sliders is just a JavaScript uh, range control. And there's an on-change listener for them. And so I register an on-change function. And since there's three sliders, one of the first things the function has to do is it has to go out there and get the color. So it gets all the, and it says, hey, what are these? And it builds a string. And then I set the inner text of the RGB so we know what color it is there. And I set the preview color, which works good for bright colors. And it doesn't work as good for uh, lower color, for uh, darker colors, but it works good enough. And then I call a function send to Arduino. And I'm passing that color string there. And so in send to Arduino, all that basically does is it does write, which it puts the C and the line feed on there, and it just sends that data so we know that and have that there. Once again, it's like amazingly simple. So on the Arduino side, I have in the loop, um, Bluetooth, once again, is set up to be software serial, like we had before. And so this is kind of a neat function of the uh, serial API on Arduino, is we can just say find. So it'll read serial data until it finds the character C. So it's looking for that delimiter. And then it can parse those next three integers. So there's no error handling code here. It's assuming that the client's going to do the right thing. Uh, so in production code, you'd have better stuff. But works good enough. And then show color, I take those components. And there is a function that basically uses the API provided by these lights to set the color. Um, so each of these apps, you know, it's 100, 150 lines of code on either side of this to make this work. So now, these are kind of toy apps. One demonstrates uh, writing from the Arduino to the phone, the other from the phone to the Arduino. But the, uh, most apps will try to use a combination of both of those. One other caveat on this is that since we're using um, uh, iOS for this, the, rate, the hardware that I'm using is specific. So if I want to do this with Android, 
I need to put a Bluetooth Classic radio on here. Um, and if I want to do it with iOS, I need to use a Bluetooth low energy radio. So that's one of the uh, things today is that what, how I'm going to interact is going to affect how I build these things. So if I wanted this to work for both iOS and Android, I'd need to have two Bluetooth radios on this thing, uh, which you can do. Right now, there's only support for Bluetooth low energy for iOS within the plugin. If you're using Android 4.4, there's actually uh, Bluetooth low energy support, but the plugin doesn't support it yet. So for an example of a app that does two-way communication, um, I built a blue, Bluetooth low energy lock in uh, the Make Magazine blog. Uh, had a project on that last week. So if you just go to Make Magazine, you search for Bluetooth Low Energy Lock. And uh, that provides the hardware, how you set it up. And basically with an iPhone, you can put in a passcode and it will lock or unlock the lock. And then we use data coming from the Arduino to be showing the statuses and what's going on. And so there's a iOS app uh, on GitHub linked to from that article. So you can check out all the code and try that if you want. Um, I have that hardware with me. I'm not going to demo it right now since it's tough to demo without a camera. Oh. And uh, I, I got a call the other day, actually. Someone wanted me to write a plug-in for him. And I was like, well, hey, how'd you hear about me? And he's like, oh, we're using your Bluetooth serial plug-in. I'm like, really? What are you using it in? And so Stride Tool has a, um, an app for iOS and Android for HVAC people. Uh, usually when they're doing, uh, you have to hook up a bunch of gauges when they're, t when they're testing HVAC HVAC systems, testing them, charging them, stuff like that. And these guys created a set of virtual gauges that uses Bluetooth, and you can use iPhone or Android, and you have the gauges on there, and uh, get to see what's going on. So that was pretty cool. I, I forgot to put the screenshot into that app. So just to recap, the Bluetooth serial plugin, uh, it's Bluetooth Classic for uh, Android, Bluetooth Low Energy for iOS. You can list or discover devices. That's where the API differs a little bit. You can connect to a peripheral. Peripheral is a funny word for device that's used a lot in the Bluetooth world. Uh, you can write to send data, and you want to subscribe to read data. So you can read data, but I highly recommend you subscribe because it works much better with the whole callback uh, JavaScript way of working things. So that's pretty cool, and that's just a regular Arduino. So this is some new hardware, which I really like because it's kind of really small. So this is called an RF Duino, and it's a very small um, Arduino compatible uh, hardware. And it has an ARM chip and a Bluetooth radio in there, and I think they cost less than 20 bucks. Um, you need a programmer that goes with them that's separate, but the cool thing about them is they're starting to get to the point where you can build something with this, and then you're like, hey, I don't have that much money invested, I can leave this in the hardware. It's great for prototyping things too. So uh, I have one of them here that has a, um, a battery attached to it. It'll run off a AA battery. I had something running off a coin cell battery the other day, but it chews through coin cell batteries really fast with the stuff I was doing. So you can do that. You can turn it on. Now this thing is running, and it's Bluetooth, which is super cool. So I wrote a plugin for this also. After I wrote the Bluetooth serial plugin, I kind of took what I learned, and I wrote this plugin. So I think that I made the API a little bit better and a little bit cleaner. Um, I'm always trying to make better APIs and never as happy with them at the end. But So this one, instead of calling list, you call discover. And uh, when you're scanning for Bluetooth low energy devices, you could be scanning all the time, but scanning uses a lot of power on your phone. So you really want to scan and then shut down the scan. So what discover does is you say how many seconds you want to discover for. And while you're discovering, the success callback will get called for every device that it finds. So it continually calls the uh, success. So every time a device is discovered, it'll send back the name, the UUID. Advertising is kind of a weird thing, and the signal strength. So what advertising does is the RF Duino hardware, although it's low energy, there's only one service that's on there. I have no control over the service that it's uh, providing but I can set an advertising value. So in order to tell that one RF Duino is doing one thing and another RF Duino is doing another thing, we use that advertising. So it's just kind of something that the RF Duino people set up and it works pretty good. So similar to before, we can say RF Duino connect. We pass in the UUID we want, the success and the failure. And so we really wait for connect to before we call read or write. 
So on write, once again, we write hello. There is a success and a failure callback in practice. Um, I, I think I usually skip the success and failure. They're optional. So you can just write data. And if you don't care, you just write it. It goes from there. Receiving data is a little bit different. When I talked before about Bluetooth Low Energy having notify on its characteristics, when something changes, the radio tells the connected client, hey, something changed. So instead of having to uh, register for delimiters and stuff like this, we know when that value changes, something's going to get called. So we use on data, and we register our function in there. We register the function that's going to get called with that data. So here's an example. Um, we get, instead of getting a string back, we actually get an array buffer back. And based on the Arduino code, uh, the Arduino code I'm going to uh, show you guys, uh, we did Arduino write float, and we put a float value in there. So I know, have to know on this side that I take that array buffer, I make it a float array, and then I grab the first element out of there. So a little bit of magic in there, but I think as long as you're controlling both sides of the pipe, it works OK. So I get the temperature in Celsius out of there, and then I convert it in Fahrenheit, and we can do something with that. So if I have my uh, Bluetooth counter counting away here, we'll kill that. So this is an example that the RF Duino folks have. They have an iPhone app that does this. This runs on both iOS and Android, but I find Android's a little easier to demo this stuff with. So for temperature, it's going out and it's finding any RF Duino devices. So similar to before, when the Bluetooth one would go out and find certain devices, this will go out and find any RF Duino devices. And it knows what RF Duinos are because they have a UUID of their services to say, hey, we offer this service and I'm filtering on that service. So I connect to it. And inside that, uh, there's an on-chip um, temperature gauge. So I'm just reading the value from the on-chip temperature gauge. And this is from the sample code they have. And basically just duplicated that to have sample code with the plug-in. And uh, so it's, it's very simple to do that. You can also do other things like these lights. You can control those. Um, so it's pretty neat hardware. It's pretty low cost and uh, easy to build things. I put screenshots in just in case this stuff didn't work. So the RF Duino plugin, Bluetooth Low Energy for iOS and Android. So that means that uh, for Android, you're going to have to be using um, uh, KitKat. I can't remember if 4.3 supports it or not, but um, KitKat has much better support. Um, it's still not quite there. The, uh, you can crash the Bluetooth stack a lot, but I think that um, Google's really working on that. So hopefully they'll get better. You discover devices instead of listing them. You connect to a peripheral just like before, and you write to send data, and you subscribe to read data. So a lot of it works the same. Small amounts of code, you can do that communication. So kind of looking at the future, I think that Bluetooth serial works really well for these kind of things. I think that, um, that Bluetooth low energy, though, is going to be a lot better, especially the experience of working with the RF Duino and getting the automatic callbacks. That's cool. One of the things, if you go and you look at the Google s samples in the SDK, they actually have the Bluetooth, class, the Bluetooth Classic examples listed under legacy now. Um, so I think that even they're kind of pushing towards doing the low energy. For a device like this where I control both ends and we're sending serial data, Bluetooth Classic works really well. The things where I think that Bluetooth low energy is going to work better is when I want to make my phone connect to other things, like smart robotics as a light bulb. And they have an app with that, but it's better if I can write my own. So you could go out there, if you could specify, hey, I want to connect to this service. You interrogate the service. You find out what characteristics are there. You can read and write those properties. So that's all good stuff. Um, I'm working on some of that, um, but I don't have a plugin to do that yet. There is a guy, uh, Rand Dusting, and he started a Bluetooth low energy plugin. It's a pretty new. But uh, there's a lot of people using it. There's a lot of um, activity on GitHub. So that could be something we're checking out if you need Bluetooth Low Energy now uh, to, to connect to other non-Arduino-based devices. Uh, so I want to mention that uh, we're having a Cordova hackathon tomorrow. And uh, I will be there uh, most of the day hanging out. And uh, I know that there's a couple goals working on that. But if you have other you know, things you want to work on, especially if it deals with Bluetooth, or near-field communication, I'll be there and happy to hack on code with people. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about is that I have um, iOS and Android support for these. Uh, I consider writing um, 
uh, Windows Phone or BlackBerry drivers for those. I don't know if anyone has int any interest in that. I'd be happy to talk to you guys about it. Unfortunately, right now, just with iOS and Android having the major market share, that's where I usually spend most of my uh, effort. So there's a bunch of links here. These slides are on GitHub. Um, if you go to uh, don.github.io slash slides, there'll be a link. And uh, now I'll open it up for questions. Yes. So the, with Bluetooth Classic, the way to do security is you pair the device. Um, with Bluetooth Low Energy, there are ways you can bond a device. Now, these plugins don't support that there. Um, it's, I'm doing a lot of research with some people on this, and it's not entirely clear how that works. Uh, Bluetooth does encrypt the traffic going back and forth. The downside is people have already broken that encryption, so it's kind of just keeping the good guys out. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. For things like the... Uh, the, you know, the Bluetooth lock example I have, which was a pretty trivial example, but for, a, uh, for, for, better, lock, for better things with that, I was actually talking with people who are going to build real hardware. So once you connected the Bluetooth low energy, you would bond, which creates a better connection, and then we'd be sending data across. Uh, but there's still, if someone was malicious and got man in the middle, there is some man in the middle protection. If you read the specs, I'm not sure how good it is. So pretty much unknown right now. Yeah. So, Yeah, no, it's not um it's not really set up for doing things like transferring files or uh sending music and that's where the Bluetooth Classic is going to work a lot better. Um and there's the there's different Bluetooth specs for that. Uh, I was working with a guy who was using the RF Duinos, and he had um, he was doing a study for the EPA, and he had all these drop down in wells at remote sites, and he wanted to go by once a week, and um, there was a little SD card on him, and he wanted to retrieve the log files over um, Bluetooth Low Energy, and so we actually got that to work, and we were streaming data. The problem is it was really slow, so one we had to send things in 20 byte chunks. And then on the um, iOS side, there's a limitation where you can only read data every 30 milliseconds, which sounds pretty quick, but when you're going to transfer a big log files, it really matters. So we had to basically throttle the um, downloading of the code. Um, so we got it to work. He uh, made his log files a little less verbose, and uh, we were able to do it. But that's really abusing the API there. It's more meant for controlling things. Uh, a lot of the hardware that will support uh, Bluetooth low energy, you can get hardware that's like dual mode hardware that can do classic and low energy. So if you need to do something like music or other stuff like that, it would be better to stick with classic. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a RF Duino log reader on my GitHub if you wanted to see how we did that with the uh, transferring those large files. Yeah, I think you could do a remote control. I mean, like on the um, the notification that comes back for the reads on iOS, if um, and the notifications on the slave device, I think you could probably be fast enough for things like a remote control. So yeah, if you need to do very frequent data, that shouldn't be a problem as long as it's going to be small chunks of data. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was being dropped on the refresh rate. If you actually look at it on the phone, you should have seen every counter. Um, it's just there was like a four frames a second or something is what it's supposed to do for that. But it's basically grabbing screenshots with uh, one of the tools in DDMS and displaying it. So if, if you want to verify that, come up after. We can run it again and check. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, right, so on the JavaScript layer I called subscribe, and I passed in basically some data with a callback. Um, although I call that subscribe, it works exactly like uh, any other Cordova callback. The one thing I do is on the success callback, 
is I hold a reference to that in my native code. I basically say that you can say uh, on the callback handles, you can say keep callback is true, and then I have a member variable. So then whenever data comes in, I just keep calling that callback saying keep callback. Um, so it's working the same as like the camera API when it sends a picture back or more like geolocation. I think geolocation just keeps calling the same callback again and again, basically using the same sort of internals that other Cordova plugins use. Yeah. So um, for me, I've been writing a lot of plugins and kind of seeing how Cordova changes a lot. So I, I'm pretty experienced doing that, but I know that for working with some people who are just starting off to write plugins, that getting started can kind of be a little bit of a hassle. Fortunately, with uh, starting at Cordova 3.2, it's gotten a lot better because all the core stuff follows the same pattern now. So you can go and you can look at a plugin, you can see the plugins XML, you can say, hey, this is how I break things down. So I think from a developer perspective, especially as a third party plugin writer, it's gotten a lot friendlier. And there's even some people working on generators that'll kind of generate you a plugin project to get you started. Um, so I think it's pretty favorable. It's getting a lot better. They're doing tons of work. And I love the plugin registry too. The fact that you, I can just put my plugins out there and then people can discover them and go from there. Anyone else? All right. Well, uh, thank you guys for coming out, and uh, I'll be around, especially at the hackathon tomorrow, if you want to talk about the stuff or just talk about Cordova in general. Just look for me. Go from there. Thanks. Thanks.